My name is Jonathan Thornton. I'm an emergency medicine resident, and this is my interesting case presentation. This case took place during my night month this past winter. It was a particularly busy night with a lot of traumas coming in. It was around 2 a.m. when I see EMS rolling in with a the patient. They give me their report, tell me the chief complaint is syncope. He was sitting in bed with his wife, and suddenly he passed out. He did not hit his head or have any significant trauma since he was already seated. He woke up about a minute later, according to the wife, and he was alert-oriented at that time. She denied any seizure-like activity. When he woke, he had a headache, but otherwise was feeling normal with no complaints. Going a little deeper into his history and what led up to the syncope, he denied any illness prior history of syncope. He denied any shortness of breath, chest pain, or recent illness. He told me he had diabetes that is well controlled with oral meds, but then he also admitted that he smoked meth about 30 minutes prior to a syncope tonight. He had a long history of probably substance abuse, but he had been sober for quite some time. On physical exam, he appeared to be an obese male, stated age, alert and oriented, cooperative, did not seem intoxicated at all. Vital signs were normal other than a slightly borderline tachycardia. Otherwise, his physical exam was uh, essentially unremarkable. At this point, you're probably wondering why I would be presenting syncope as, a, as an interesting case presentation. It's not that interesting other than fainting goats, so who cares about syncope? Well, it's an extremely common cause of emergency department visits, accounting for 3% of ED visits nationwide. It also has a very wide differential, wide dispositions ranging from home to ICU, and there's a wide range of workups that we do in the ER. As I mentioned, the differential is broad. Most common type is vasovagal or neurocardiogenic. That's the classic faint at the site of blood or something like that. Also can be orthostatic hypotension, carotid sinus hypersensitivity causing a vagal response, and also medications and polypharmacy in the elderly. The differential for syncope also includes things that aren't syncope, so it's important to get a good history. Seizures can sometimes be confused as, as syncope. Drug overdoses, TIAs, migraines, and hypoglycemia are just a few of the things that can, that can look like syncope. Getting into some of the more serious causes of syncope, a lot of them are cardiac in nature. One of the main things we worry about is an arrhythmia. A lot of different types of dysrhythmias can uh, result in syncope. Ischemia or myocardial infarction can also obviously cause syncope. Certain valvular problems like aortic stenosis may also manifest as syncope. Hemorrhage or anemia is another cause. Acute blood loss would be pretty obvious, but GI bleeds or anemic patients may not be so obvious. Pulmonary embolus should always be considered in syncope if there are risk factors. Intracranial hemorrhage is also another cause that we can't forget. And lastly, a lot of the time, we just don't know what the exact cause of the syncope was. So like I mentioned, the workup varies a lot from physician to physician and patient to patient. So one of the most important aspects of the workup is the history and physical. This will give you clues as to which category they may fall into and, and uh, guide you into the appropriate test to figure out what's going on. Typical basic workup might include an ECG for clues of the uh, cardiac causes like arrhythmias, CBC to rule out blood loss or anemia, electrolyte panel may reveal an underlying electrolyte abnormality, chest x-ray may show signs of infection or CHF, head CTs to rule out intracranial abnormalities are also options depending on the patient and their presentation. All of these tests don't necessarily have to be done in the ER. Uh, some other tests might be done as an inpatient or as outpatient, including echocardiogram to evaluate the heart, carotid ultrasounds if there's concern for a TIA, also Holter monitors for arrhythmia if you didn't catch it in the ECG. This leads us to the disposition. This comes down to is the patient high risk or not? This is basically clinical gestalt, but there is a tool to help with this, the San Francisco syncope rule. Uh, categorizes patients into high risk or not high risk by asking uh, these five questions here. If the answer is yes to any of these questions at all, then the patient is high risk and the appropriate workup needs to be obtained. While the San Francisco syncope rule is pretty helpful, most of us don't need, us to, need it to tell us if they're high risk or not, so I prefer this algorithm from ASEP that is a little bit more specific. Uh, going down the left side for syncope, based on history, physical, and ECG, uh, if you don't have a clear-cut diagnosis, you go down the right and risk stratify. High-risk patients would get admitted for further workup. Low-risk patients can be discharged with follow-up. If you do know the diagnosis after HMP and ECG, then you go down the left side. 
This is fairly obvious, but serious causes get admitted for further workup and treatment, and the common non-serious causes can be safely discharged home with follow-up. So back to the case of the gentleman who smoked meth and had syncopal event. My initial impression of this was that it was a pretty obvious cause of syncope and he'd be discharged home. His workup was negative. However, he kept complaining of a headache despite Tylenol. So we ended up getting a CT scan of his head. CT was positive for an acute and extensive subarachnoid hemorrhage. I thought that this was likely uh, aneurysmal in nature considering he didn't have any significant trauma. Uh, a CT angiogram was ordered and neurosurgery was consulted. By their recommendation, we gave him some TXA and uh, the CT angiogram revealed a 7 millimeter anterior communicating artery aneurysm that was likely the cause of his intracranial uh, hemorrhage. He was taken to the angio suite for emergent coiling of that aneurysm, which was successful. From there, he was uh, admitted to the neuro ICU for further monitoring. He had some issues with vasospasm and hydrocephalus. But overall, he had a pretty good result from the procedure. He was in the hospital for about two weeks uh, and was discharged home with no further complications. He'll only need to get yearly CTs to keep an eye on that aneurysm. So it ended up being a fairly good result. So I presented this unusual presentation of syncope for a couple reasons. One was to go through that wide differential and work up for syncope. And the other was because it was kind of a lesson learned for me not to anchor my di diagnosis on something that EMS tells you or the HMP like uh, a history of meth uh, because that can sometimes lead you down the wrong path and cause uh, poor outcomes for your patients.